Alongside securing peace and security, one of the stated purposes of a great deal of contemporary international law is the alleviation of poverty. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the motto of the World Bank, our dream is a world free of poverty. But the same stated purpose applies to many international institutions, including UNCTAD, um, dealing with trade and development, the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, um, the UNDP, the list goes on. Even the United Nations, for example, uh, includes as one of its four explicit aims in the preamble to the Charter, the expressed commitment to the promotion of social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom. And indeed, as recently as two weeks ago, the person we might think of as um, the voice of the international community, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, used his opening address to the G20 summit being held in Toronto to, quote, stress the concerns of the world's most vulnerable and the need for everyone to step up efforts to eradicate poverty. But despite more than 60 years of development, the proliferation of a huge international bureaucracy and thousands of NGOs dedicated to the alleviation of poverty, the gains have been what we would have to call modest at best. According to recent World Bank statistics, half the world's people live below a poverty line of $2.50 a day, and many far below that. What living below the poverty line means in real terms for the people who are described by that statistic is that they lack, as Thomas Pogger puts it, secure access to the minimum requirements of human existence, safe food and water, clothing, shelter, basic medical care, and basic education. And when you take China out of the picture, the idea of improvement or progress in this area is even less persuasive. Improvements in the statistics on poverty really just flatline. This modest improvement in absolute numbers of people living below the poverty line is especially perplexing when we hear that estimates have been made that over the last five decades, $2.3 trillion have been spent on foreign aid and that during the 20th century, the world economy has grown 20-fold. Perhaps even more significant than the relative modesty of the gains by themselves, though, is the fact that over the same period, there has been a very marked increase in the growth of inequality, both within and across nations. So, for example, the richest 50 people in the world own more than the poorest 416 million combined. Or, for example, the fact that in 1960, the ratio of per capita income of Europe to Africa was 30 to 1, and in 2005, it was 40 to 1. This um, distributional question is sometimes known without irony, I think, as the champagne glass effect. Added to the mix of these puzzlingly small gains in poverty reduction and the growth in inequality, it's now unavoidable that we're also using far too much of the planet. So those of you who came to hear Professor Robin Eckersley speaking last week, uh, not last week, in this series, will have heard about these limits in terms of carbon emissions but as this slide shows, the green represents um, the Earth's boundaries in a sense. The red represents how much we're using, whether we're close to the boundaries, whether we've radically depassed them. And uh, those, a couple of them are as yet to be quantified. But I'll return to this problem a bit later and what it might imply for the development project. Because what we really want to think about tonight is where does international law fit into this picture? And how does it relate to the question of who's afraid of international law, the theme of this lecture theory series? Well, one answer to the question seems to be that the bad governments of poor countries are, or at least should be, afraid of international law. In that argument, the international community should leverage that fear, or perhaps more accurately, that enforcement, or that enforceability, into results for the people who live in those poor countries. So in the picture that Gary Simpson evocatively painted in his opening lecture to this series, this answer is the first of three possible attitudes that he described, which lead to three different answers to the question of who's afraid of international law. But in fact, the answer is not dissimilar to the one Professor Tim McCormack actually did give to the question. Um, so explicitly in Tim's talk, international criminals who commit atrocities should be afraid of international law. But implicitly, of course, the answer is 
international criminals from poor countries who commit atrocities. But such an answer is also implicit in the response from many quarters to these sobering statistics that I've just recited. So in addition to increased aid, in that response the call is made for more. More law, more and better institutions, more and better human rights, more and better enforcement. And for better or worse, that call has been largely successful. So since the 1950s, there's been a huge proliferation of institutions, treaties, declarations and conferences dealing with development. And at the same time as this expansion, there's also been a convergence between the different branches of international law and between different institutions. So that what we, so what we might call the different specialist areas of international law are coming together. So for example, Human rights used to be a discourse that was understood to be antagonistic to development. And I'm sure that many of you can remember the way that leaders in Asia in particular used to talk about the need to sacrifice the rights of the individual for the greater collective goal of national development. But now human rights has become part of the orthodoxy of development. So since 1997, when UN Secretary General Kofi Annan um, made a call to mainstream human rights into all the work of the UN, a growing number of development agencies have been applying what's called a human rights-based approach to their work. And that institutionalisation was reinforced by the 2005 World Summit Outcome Document. So many people hail this coming together and the proliferation of law and institutions as a victory. They see it as the spread of universal values and of evidence of the ever closer integration of the international community. And the harmonisation of development and human rights must surely be a good thing, right? Well, I would suggest that before we decide to join the chorus of voices calling for more law and more rights and more institutions to solve the question of global poverty, we need to stop and consider whether international law is part of the problem of the causes and persistence of poverty in the world today. And in my argument, it is. And what I want to do in the next 40 minutes or so is outline how international law currently plays into the problem of global poverty and the ways in which it exacerbates it rather than reducing it and what might be done about that. In terms of the subject matter of this lecture series then, which is essentially focusing on the question of authority I want to slow that question down and first ask what kinds of practices international law authorises, for without authorisation there can be no authority. So who's afraid of international law? Well the answer is very different depending on where you sit and I would say currently one answer would have to be all the wrong people. Rich states who should be are not afraid enough and those who should have the least to fear from a legal order which is meant to be founded on peace, security and the betterment of life really have the most to fear from the current legal order. But, and this is a big but, this certainly doesn't mean that we should trash international law and human rights. And really it's not feasible to imagine a peaceful or even peaceful-ish world without them. International law and human rights in particular remain what Gary in his opening lecture called a powerful vocabulary for moral concerns. Or as I might put it slightly differently, it's a very important language in which ethical demands about the world are articulated. And actually as we can see from this photograph, which was taken at the protests around the G20 summit in Toronto last week, um, and which shows the way that more human rights are equated with less poverty, International law and human rights are probably the most compelling secular language of justice available to us in the present day. But, and this is an equally big reservation, the fact that 50,000 human beings, mostly children, mostly female, mostly not white, die every day from poverty-related causes poses a serious challenge to the legitimacy of the international order. We need to think hard about what that, whether that fact implies the inversion or even the perversion of the promise of justice embedded in contemporary international law. Can we really just assume that the many injustices produced through the operation of the global legal order are all simply exceptions or distortions 
just so much collateral damage in the execution of, of a project whose bona fides are beyond question? Or do we have to think about the structure of international law itself as possibly implicated in the production of those injustices? I would suggest that even as international law bears a symbolic relation to justice, we need to make a significant conceptual shift in relation to how we are to understand it and how we use it if it's to be captured by and in the interests of the people who Park the Chatterjee reminds us are most of the world. So specifically, I would suggest that the problematic relation between international law and solutions to global poverty arises for one main reason. And that is because development has become a proxy for the way we talk about questions of material well-being and global inequality. What I mean by this is that development has become synonymous with the way we talk about need. So even as I was introducing my subject matter just now, I slipped without hesitation from a conversation about material want to the idea of development. And I'm sure it didn't jar with most people in the room. When we talk about the persistence of global poverty, the solution is always development. The efforts of the world to eradicate hunger, to empower women, to increase primary education, to reduce child and infant mortality, to improve maternal health, are called the Millennium Development Goals. Trade negotiation rounds which are meant to help poor countries are called the Development Rounds. And the way we deal with the problem of environment is through sustainable development. And identities as diverse as Colombian, Ghanaian, Malaysian, Pakistani, are seamlessly united by the concept in which great swathes of nation states are, are lumped together as developing states, not only in the face of obvious differences between their societies, but equally whether the development project is moribund, like in Sudan, or seems to have been successful, like in Singapore. But, I can hear you saying, why does this matter? Surely it's just a word, and what we really mean when we use it is just a general encapsulation of the idea of countries improving their standard of living. Surely what's important is the idea of getting better or progress that it implies. But development as an idea, in fact, doesn't just mean a general improvement of any kind in people's quality of life, and it's not just a word. Instead, it's a specific way of knowing the world that is both discourse and institutional machinery. Excuse me. And although time constraints mean I can't go into it now, it also has a very particular history and carries a conceptual baggage with it because of that. So in my argument today, two main problems arise with the way that development has come to be the only way that we, or at least the institutions of the international community, understand global poverty and what to do about it. And of course, how that relates to international law. The first is the explanation about um, the first is the explanation about the causes of poverty that development provides. The second is the way that economic growth lies at the heart of its promise for a better world, despite many attempts to refine or even to redefine it. So turning first to the causes of global poverty. I'm sure, as, I'm sure that all of you know that many volumes have been dedicated to the question of why some countries are poor. These books multiply if we include implicit as well as explicit explanations. Such explanations include the idea that some countries are poor because of their political culture. They have corrupt elites, um, oppressive governments, no formal laws and institutions. Or that the religious and philosophical traditions that underlie their institutions are not adapted to a modern economy and don't reward the industriousness and cooperative efforts of their members. Or again, blame is sheeted home to the absence of infrastructure and the limitations that offers to investors and local entrepreneurs. Other explanations suggest that physical endowments are to blame, that some states have been unlucky in the geographic lottery, they're landlocked, they have no natural resources. And yet others suggest that the causes of poverty lie in the history of slavery and colonial exploitation, or in unfair trade rules and the differential impacts of some the economies, uh, the practices of some economies on others. Or again, in the way that certain practices of international lending have created an insurmountable debt burden for some states. 
So if we schematise these responses, they fall into four categories. Geographic, historical, global and local factors. So, for example, the idea that poor governance and corruption explain a country's relative poverty are local causes. Um, the idea that some people are culturally not adapted to capitalism are also local causes. The idea that colonialism created structures which have hindered a country's growth, um, for example, a heavy reliance on one or two commodities, are both international and historical. Or the idea that unfair global trade rules and agricultural subsidies in rich countries, for example, prevent for poor countries from trading their way out of poverty at international causes. Now, it's undoubtedly true that in relation to income poverty, many of these causes are operative at the same time. But one of the big problems with development discourse is the way that it locates the causes of poverty only in the local and present causes and does not, perhaps cannot, take account of the international or global and historical causes of poverty. This is particularly true of the institutionalised story of development. In other words, development has a very specific explanation for what causes poverty. And the effect of understanding the causes of poverty in this way is to concentrate measures to address it in projects overwhelmingly directed at the transformation of the developing society its political, legal, economic and social structures, basically for the purposes of producing what we think of as a modern nation state able to compete effectively and to trade freely in an essentially benign international marketplace. There have of course been many critiques of this worldview and from many perspectives. Philosopher Thomas Pogger, for example, points out that free trade is a myth. So he argues that even as poor countries are promised trade-led development, the rules favour rich countries by allowing them to protect their markets and subsidise exports in a way that poor countries are not allowed to or can't afford to. Just one example of this is a recent estimate by ex-World Bank Chief Economist Nicholas Stern that in 2002, rich countries spent about $300 billion on export subsidies for agricultural products alone, roughly six times their total development aid. I'm sure you've all heard the statistic about cows in Europe famously receiving annual subsidies of $900 a cow um, and in Japan of $2,700 a cow, far above the uh, annual income of most human beings, let alone the aid budget per capita. But on the other side of the equation, rich countries impose what are known as escalating tariffs, applying low tariffs to raw materials and often none at all to the materials that can't be grown in rich countries and then raising tariffs sharply with each step up the value chain. So this ensures cheap raw materials for rich countries whilst at the same time undermining manufacturing and employment in poor countries. So Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, for example, are confined to exporting unprocessed cocoa beans. Uganda and Kenya to raw, co raw coffee beans, um, Mali and Burkina Faso to raw cotton. There are many more examples of the way that the current trade rules are in fact not free and create capital flows and lost opportunities that hurt poor countries in ways which simply dwarf foreign aid flows. In a similar vein though from the opposite end of the political spectrum, financial journalist and free trade defender Martin Wolf agrees that the treatment accorded to poorest states in the trading regime is quote, a disgrace. In his latest book he catalogues a litany of what he calls obscenities arising from the EU's common agricultural policy, US cotton subsidies, the license payments demanded through the TRIPS agreement, intellectual property agreement, the list goes on. From a different perspective again, one that questions the ideology that free trade will bring development at all, economists such as Harjun Chang and Danny Roderick and Eric Reinert describe the recipe of free trade as the path to wealth as both historically inaccurate and theoretically flawed. According to these analyses, the theory of comparative advantage on which free trade is founded is focused only on short-term gains and can justify itself only if you're happy to accept the global status quo, which would imply the continued underdevelopment of poor countries. Historically speaking, these thinkers argue, rich countries got rich by following precisely the opposite of the policies the international development institutions such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank impose upon developing states. Famously, according to Chang, rich countries have got rich and through international laws and institutions have kicked away the ladder 
so that poor countries are unlikely to be are likely to be stuck in poverty if they follow the rules. The debt question too is equally looming in an analysis of the causes of global poverty, which est with estimates by the Debt Forgiveness Campaign Jubilee 2000 that 107 countries need debt cancellation to enable them to meet their people's basic needs if they're not to tax people below what they call the ethical poverty line of $3 a day. So, for example, in 2005 and 6, Kenya's budget for debt payments was as much as for water, health, agriculture, roads, transport and finance combined. So the causes of the current debt levels are complex to explain and I can say more in response to questions if people are interested, but although some of the debt is certainly legitimate, much of it is illegitimate, having arisen through irresponsible lending during the oil boom in the 1960s and 70s, often for Cold War strategic reasons, for projects which were misconceived or failed to utterly corrupt or racist governments known to be such by the lenders when repayment was never likely. Add to this the decline in the price of commodities over the same period, the fact that the loans were denominated in hard, cu hard currencies like the dollar, and the risk that that exposes the borrower to, to things which are beyond their control, such as interest rate rises and currency volatility. And factor in too the way that in times of crisis, conditionalities of the international institutions have been used to restructure poor economies, primarily to ensure loan repayment and the stability of the international banking system so that debt servicing is facilitated by cutting public spending in health, education and food subsidies. And more, the conditions also include poor countries opening their markets to the imports from rich countries which, as I've said, are often subsidised. And you can start to see how the existence of third world debt is a very effective juridified or legal mechanism which transfers wealth and risk in opposite directions. So risk is transferred from those who can most afford it, banks, uh, rich countries and the banks in them, to the people of the third world who can least afford it. And wealth is transferred in the other direction, from the people who can most afford it, from the people who can least afford it to the people who can most afford it. So as you can see, conditionality is an important point of connection between the pieces of the puzzle of global poverty. Conditionality means the conditions legally imposed on many third world states by the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank in return for their own lending, but it's also insisted upon by many other lenders, including sovereign lenders and private banks. But because in the development story, the international causes of poverty are simply not on the table, the attempts to alleviate poverty um, have for the last 60 years not resulted in wholesale changes to the global terms of trade, nor in good faith debt forgiveness. Instead, it's resulted in developing countries having to open up more and more of themselves to transformation by international agencies. So over the same period as the ballooning debt, there's been a huge expansion in the remit of the international financial institutions. The scope of the areas in which it's considered legitimate, indeed legal, to intervene in poor countries in the name of development has continued to widen. The conditions used to be counted in points, now they're counted in pages. Development institutions used to be concerned with building bridges, now they're concerned with building democracy. We can get a clearer view of what's happening here by thinking about how international law is implicated in the, implication, in the explanation of what causes po poverty by its structure. It's a structure that localises responsibility through its focus on the nation state. There is no jurisdiction within international law for calling the political economic causes of poverty to account. So even though development is understood as a global project, there's no global responsibility. There's only ever national responsibility. The World Bank, for example, has no jurisdiction over the rich. So even if it understands the way that agricultural subsidies, for example, hurt poor countries, and clearly it does, it can't do anything about them. But perhaps worse, even though it's limited in this way, it continues to espouse the free trade ideology and to support conditions imposed by the fund, for example, which oblige poor countries to open their markets and liberalise their investment rules and so on. Recommending these policies in a perfect world is already highly contested by economists like Chang and Roderick, 
but enforcing them in the conditions of the real world of geopolitics has to be the triumph of hope over experience. Indeed, over 50 years of the experience of the immiseration that the policies have caused.